So good morning, everyone. Welcome to Clergy Conversations. And we are very honored today to have the Most Reverend Frank Griswold, who served as the 25th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church from 1998 to 2006. Before becoming presiding bishop, Bishop Griswold was Bishop of Chicago from 1987 to 1997, and Bishop Coadjutor of Chicago, 1985 to 1987. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1963 and served in three parishes in the Diocese of Pennsylvania, including our local church of St. Martin's, right. and he now lives with his wife Phoebe in Chestnut Hill. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful that you are a neighbor and welcome back yes, to we, St. Paul's. We, we came home, so to speak. <laughs> you came home, that's great. Well, thank you so much for for giving us your time and your wisdom and your service oh, uh, you. to a church. And we are recording this on Inauguration Day. Indeed, yes, I'm well aware of that. A very profound moment mm -hmm. in terms of a, a turn, a, yeah. a turning the page in our, in our national life. And it'll be good to kind of come back to that. But I wanted okay. to talk about your early life. What was it like growing up in Philadelphia in the 1940s. What were the sort of formative influences? What was church life like back then? Well, church life was pretty absent. I, I was uh, baptized according to the rites of the Book of Common Prayer on the 1st of January 1938 as the prelude to a New Year's Day cocktail party in my grandmother's house. So this was cultural Episcopalianism, and I rather thought later on as I discovered the church, if Jesus could do his first miracle at a wedding reception, I guess it's all right to be baptized in the context of a New Year's Day cocktail party, so to speak. Anyhow, uh, I went to um, things like Christmas pageants, but there was no active uh, church life, in large measure because my mother's father had died when she was quite young from influenza, and she prayed desperately that he wouldn't die, and he died, and so she, she blamed God. Uh, in any event, I was sent off to an Episcopal boarding school and forced into the choir because you had to try out, and if you had a passable voice, you had to sing for a year. So that was the church, discovering the church, the mystery of all these strange words, Kyrie and Gloria and all the rest of it. And uh, something took, and there were seven priests on the faculty, and they noticed budding something or other in me. And some were quite high church, and some were quite low church, and so there was sort of a, who's going to get Frank Griswold, you know? And uh, uh, in any event, um, I emerged from boarding school, went to college, uh, it, I went to Harvard, which had a, an Episcopal monastery within a couple of yards of my dormitory. I got to know the monks there. I became an acolyte. That uh, deepened a sense of uh, wanting to be ordained. I then went to a seminary in New York, general seminary for a year. I left. I went to England, took a degree in theology at Oxford, came back, uh, was immediately a junior curate at the Church of the Redeemer of Bryn Mawr. And there I was for a while until I went to Yardley. Oh, I got married. I mean, that's, the, that's quite important, uh, <laughs> the Church of the Redeemer. Uh, I married the, one of the godmothers of the rector's uh, first grandchild. We met, Phoebe and I met at a baptism. I like to say, I saw your face reflected in the waters of the <laughs> font, which is usually when she hits me. But any, anyhow, uh, we got married. We went to Yardley. We had our two children there. And then we, in a sense, came back uh, to Chestnut Hill, to St. Martin's, where I previously, as rector of the church in Yardley, had come to give lectures on the revision of the Book of Common Prayer. And so suddenly I was now in church as the rector of the church I'd come to to help explain what this was all about. And so we had some wonderful years at St. Martin's, and I thought, I'm probably here till I retire. And then a friend called me from Evanston, Illinois, and said, some of us would like to put your name in as a possible candidate for bishop. And I was flattered. Uh, and 
you know, I had no idea where it would go, and uh, I suddenly found I had answered some questions, and I found that I was one of four people, and I went to Chicago and declaimed. I had 20 minutes to explain my vision, and I thought, this is pretty presumptuous, since I don't really know Chicago, sitting in front of the diocesan bishop, Bishop Montgomery. Uh, in any event, uh, I came home, and the day of the election was the uh, uh, diocesan convention here in Philadelphia, the day that Lyman Ogilvy announced he was retiring. And I knew that this election was going on in Chicago. One priest came up to me and said, are you in constant phone contact, because this is before cell phones, with Chicago? I said, oh no. I left early, came home, Phoebe was ashen. She said, I've just come back from the liquor store because I got a call from Chicago, from a friend there, saying, uh, I think you better start packing. So Phoebe was a wreck. And uh, then I was home and we had a daughter who was now at the boarding school I'd attended, and she, she called, and I was talking to her on the phone, and the operator broke in and said, an emergency call from Chicago. And I said to Phoebe, that probably means I'm elected, because whoever has to make the call, if, I, if they were calling to say you weren't, they'd be very glad the line was busy, and they'd call later. So in any event, that was it. Eliza came downstairs, our younger daughter. She said, my life is over. She was 13 years old. She collapsed on the floor. Uh, Phoebe looked ashen. Uh, a parishioner arrived whom we knew very well, uh, and she looked ashen. But the very funny thing, I mean, this is the divine sense of humor. That evening, I was Snoopy in a parish production of your good, a good man, Charlie Brown. And I sat on my doghouse. Now, none, no, one, no one knew what had happened that afternoon. Uh, I sat on my doghouse, and one of my lines was, yesterday I was a dog, today I'm a dog. Tomorrow I'll probably still be a dog. There's so little hope of advancement. <laughs> and I thought, there's irony here, and tomorrow morning, Sunday, they'll know what this is all about. So that's amazing. So that's the, the journey from <laughs> Bryn Mawr yeah, to, to Chicago. Uh, Chicago. And Jim Montgomery, a yeah. wonderful bishop, yeah. was one of the three consecrating yes, yes. bishops, and I, I got to know him as well. What a great holy man he was. Oh, a so lovely person. Can you tell us, so we, we recently had an ordination here. Dan Klein was ordained yeah, a priest. Yeah. And the parish um, got to see that and witness that. What, did, what is it, as you, as you became a bishop yeah. and then you became a pastor of a whole lot of priests, yeah. and and what, what did you take from those early years of priesthood? My, my early years of priesthood? I think the most important thing, and I suppose I really learned it moving to Yardley from, from uh, the Church of the Redeemer in, in uh, Bryn Mawr. I mean, when you preach at the Church of the Redeemer in those days, and it's quite a large church, it's about the size of St. Paul's, the, the house lights would dim and the, the pulpit would be illumined, and then you would sort of preach. Well, Yardley, the church seated 120 people. And the first Sunday I was there, I pulled out one of my Church of the Redeemer sermons, and I looked out, because I could see everyone, there were no house lights to dim, and they looked sort of stricken and confused. And I thought, uh-oh, something's wrong here. And over time, I realized, I mean, you probably see this, I mean, someone nods in the third pew, and it suddenly sends you off on a tangent, and you're saying something you hadn't intended to say, but you think, oh my heavens, where did that come from? And you realize that actually there's something dialogical going on here. And after uh, being in Yardley for 10 years, uh, I realized that my, what would I say, my presumption when I arrived was I had arrived to preach the word to them, you see. And I realized, as time went on, that actually their function was to shape and form me, that it was both ways. I mean, we are limbs of one body in Christ, and so the limbness extends between the clergy and, and the congregation. 
So, uh, I mean, I, I really feel I was shaped uh, in Yardley. And I'll tell you, the first day I was at St. Martin's, which, is, which in those days was not terribly dissimilar from the Church of the Redeemer in Bryn Mawr, a, a woman came in and she said to me, if you would come here straight from the Church of the Redeemer, this would be your death. Thank God you've had 10 years in Yardley. And I knew what she meant. I mean, I had uh, the owner of the local SO station and uh, the plumber, and, and there were some sort of middle management types who took the train from Trenton to New York because Yardley's right across the river from Trenton. So you had, you, had, you know, uh, business types, professional types, but you also had very local people. And uh, it, you know, it, it, it broadened my scope. I, you know, I, 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 I got over being suburban. Mm -hmm. in a sense. It really was a growth, of a growth experience. So in dealing with clergy, I would say your congregation is there to teach you as well as you teaching them. And particularly when uh, clergy would arrive with very clear ideas of who they were and what their ministry was, I'd say, watch out. If this really is of the spirit that you've been called to this congregation, you're going to be changed by it. And there's going to be some struggle and tension, and that's the way growth occurs. So listen carefully, because the spirit may actually be in some critic. I mean, this is true at St. Martin's. I mean, I love this man. Um, I mean, I, I was the diocesan chair of the liturgical commission. I taught people all about the prayer book, and I did all the bishop's services. I was Mr. Liturgy. However, there was this wonderful parishioner who, when we came to the, the exchange of the peace, would kneel down and open a hymnal over his head to avoid any human contact. <laughs> and he called it the kiss of death. And uh, I thought, I prayed, I thought, why don't you go to St. Paul's? <laughs> <laughs> Where you'd be happier. They have more morning <laughs> prayer than they do at St. Martin's. The more I prayed, the more he stayed. And then finally I realized that he actually was for my salvation lest I feel that I was God's gift to liturgy. I needed someone who, who didn't fall in line with the, the mellifluous and winning ways of Frank Griswold. So we became very close friends, We're very close friends. So St. Paul's is going through a search, as you know, yes, and yes. the red yes, arc I under that. the altar, when the search committee was commissioned, they put objects symbolizing the kinds of attributes and skills they're looking for in the next rector. So what advice would you give to the search committee oh, as they meet every Tuesday night at oh, seven? Oh, heavens, heavens. Um, I would say probably the person they should have and, and uh, should really want is someone who really isn't hell-bent to come here. Uh, there's someone who uh, is settled and confident, and, and so whatever you're going to get from that person in any kind of interview, you're going to get the truth. Uh, they're not going to try to be winning. I mean, that's the other thing I found sometimes as bishop, that clergy were very misleading. Oh, I'm very collaborative. Well, that's the last thing that person was. And then, you know, the senior warden would come and say, well, it's completely different from... I said, well, you know, these things happen. So uh, probably someone has to be coaxed. I mean, I think a church such as this probably has a pretty strong sense of its significance and its stability. And so I, a, a search committee can be a bit imperious sometimes. You know, we're, the fact we're interviewing you is a condescension because, you know, we are so special. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the mindset, but I found that in some of the, the, the cardinal parishes and the diocese, a sort of, well, you know, uh, they should be pleading with us to have them come. And I said, no, 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 that's not it. Uh, you, you're probably going to, you're probably drawn to someone who says, I'm perfectly happy where I am, and you're going to have to sell yourselves uh, and give them some sense of what is the challenge? I mean, that's the thing. What is the challenge here? Uh, I mean, I think very few people want to sort of inherit something that runs perfectly. Mm -hmm. Oh, just keep, keep us doing what we're doing. 
Uh, and of course, every priest has their own, uh, or own personality. Uh, and so that already is part of a change in the dynamic. Uh, but uh, fascinating someone winning them over because uh, the committee is so passionate about uh, the future or some hope for the future. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. So you become presiding bishop. Yes. Uh, and you, your leadership is, is very, uh, you know, it's a very difficult time in the life of the church because the beginnings of, I mean, today we are a very divided country. Yeah. And, and I wonder sometimes, because the constitution of the Episcopal Church and the constitution of the yes. country parallels each yeah. other, so yeah. there's a little way in which the Episcopal Church may be a little crucible of what is going to happen mm. in the larger community. Have, have you thoughts on that, uh, that connection between this, uh, this small but significant yes. denomination yeah. and where the country is? Yes. Um, it was a very divisive time. My particular focus was the bishops, and we met twice a year. Uh, and my sense was that um, for the bishops to appreciate one another and perceive themselves as a genuine community of, I'll call it, reconciled difference, or divergent points of view held in some kind of tension that was held by a larger reality, namely being limbs and members of Christ's body, uh, would be important for them in their dealing with their, their dioceses. And so a lot of what we did involved small table groups uh, that uh, uh, involved then people with different perspectives uh, talking about various issues. And I would go around the country and I would say to a bunch of bishops, let's say in, in New England, I'd say, I just want you to know that what you see is absolutely crystal clear and normative here in New England would be seen differently in the Southwest. I said, I'm not criticizing your points of view. I'm just simply saying that there is a kind of regionalism to the Episcopal Church. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a, altogether uh, black and white, but uh, I mean, there was certain areas were more liberal, certain areas were more conservative, and I'd say, so just be aware that uh, there are other points of view, uh, and yes, hold, you, hold yours a little lightly, uh, clearly, but, but lightly enough to make some space for people who have other points of view. And also I found uh, uh, often uh, involving, involving the bishops in a, a kind of discernment process. You take a question. Well, this, this has happened when Gene Robinson was elected and the House of Bishops had to assent to his ordination. And, I, and that was very divisive. So we met and I said, we are having a discernment, a discernment process. And I said, this is, this is what Ignatius of Loyola did when he started the Society of Jesus. You have a question, and so the question in this case is, we should approve of this Episcopal election. I said, now, even if you're in favor of it, you probably can see some negative consequences, potential negative consequences. So in the discernment process, you always begin with the negatives. So you take the question and you look at reasons why it would be wrong or create problems of some kind. So, I said, so we did this. And then you put this list aside. You take a break. Then you come back. And then you look at the positives. You go through the same thing. You pray for spiritual insight. You pray for freedom for your own bias. Can you actually look at this thing with an open mind? Uh, and then you look at the quality. You take these two lists, as it were. There may be 43 reasons why no to something. They're all fear-based on what-ifs. 
and there may be three positives, but the positives are so much clearer that you'd say, well, the quality of this is all fear-based, but this seems to be based on confidence and hope and energy. Anyhow, um, the bishops, the, the majority, did give their approval. However, that exercise was so important because the bishops who were unhappy uh, knew that the, the, the ones who had voted yes could also see some of the reasons they were anxious. So the, the, the aftermath was not rancor. Uh, in, fa in fact, I remember sort of watching this and several bishops sort of went to other bishops who were on the other side of the question and sort of got down and made it clear that, you know, we're, we're, we're brothers and, you know, uh, I value, I mean, they, they made their own sort of uh, personal reconciliations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think uh, if, you can, if you can approach things that way, uh, it's extremely helpful. The other thing that's very helpful, and I found this particularly when I was dealing with international problem, I mean, taking the whole question of sexuality, having to deal with it internationally, with, with primates and others. If you take, there's a question, let's say, an issue, but you don't begin with the issue. You begin with, let's say, who is Jesus for you? And you build a foundation of commonality. And so when you get to the level of the issue, you already have some sense of this person isn't bizarre or you know, wacko or should be got rid of. You have a sense of, oh yeah, we actually share a great deal. And so the, the level of disagreement is painful. And it doesn't mean you change your points of view, but something deeper has happened. Mm -hmm. There's a, a level of communion that has been established that isn't undermined by the disagreement. Uh, and I found that very helpful in not only, not only uh, questions of sexuality, but there are other areas as well. I mean, when uh, a congregation is upset over something, maybe the, 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 the parish meeting shouldn't be you know, about the issue mm -hmm. so much as who are we as Christians and who is Jesus for us and we're going to spend some time and what does it mean to be disciples and we'll get to the question later on. So say President Biden called you up and said, yeah. Frank, give us your advice on how to heal the country. Yeah. How, how would you see this working and maybe the role of, of our church in this? Well, I would, frankly, I mean, I look, at, I look at so much of Congress as enthralled to raw emotion. Things are simply reactive. And so I basically would, would work on some kind of small group discernment process. I mean, right now, uh, I would say, maybe take something from the Constitution as sort of, what does this mean to you? And I'd find that actually it meant pretty much the same thing to you. Mm -hmm. I was, I was inter interested yesterday, uh, uh, I saw a clip of one of the uh, confirmation hearings in which Lindsey Graham asked, um, I can't quite remember what the office was, but it was uh, uh, maybe the secretary, was secretary of state, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and he asked some questions and found that the person actually answered according to how Lindsay looked at it. And he said, oh, we're really off to a good beginning. Well, I mean, uh, genuinely inquiring can be useful, but you need a, you need a ground. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you take something out of the Constitution, and who are we as legis elected by our constituencies, how are we to, what does this mean to us personally, mm -hmm. and what does it mean to us as we work together? Mm -hmm. it, that's something, that kind of an exercise, and then reminding people that they've had it. You know, when things get really sort of intense, you can sort of say, remember when we looked at that section on the Constitution, what was the uppermost value in this moment of high intense emotion? Is this an invitation to sort of take a few moments 
and simply remember that conversation before we go on with this debate, you know, something like that. Interesting. So you started talking about your work with the other primates yeah. around the world, and yeah. again, the Episcopal Church was kind of caught in kind of this major culture war going on yeah. around the world, and in some ways it was almost a proxy war uh, yeah. that, that was started in the United States, but then was exported to yeah. Africa. and. Yeah. So what, what were some of the difficult experiences that you personally went through during that time? Well, uh, I mean, there had to be a special primates meeting after uh, the Gene Robinson election. And uh, that was extremely unpleasant. Were you blamed for that? Well, you see, in a sense, yes, because in many parts of the Anglican Communion, the primate has veto power. And in fact, I was called before uh, a Lambeth Commission and queried by a very, very intense English bishop who asked me why I hadn't vetoed uh, the election. And I said, I have no power of veto. In fact, canonically, my role as presiding bishop is when uh, someone is confirmed to take order for their consecration. And if I can't do that, I really can't be the presiding bishop. I'd have to resign. That's the role. And he, you know, that was sort of uh, shocking to him. So first of all, I mean, at a very elementary level, the polities in the different parts of the Anglican Union are quite different. Mm -hmm. For instance, in England, no bishop visits a congregation unless they're invited. There is no such thing as a canonical visit. So when Jane, hit, Jane uh, Dixon in Washington insisted on visiting, I can't remember the church, but it was a church that was opposed to the ordination of women, English bishops were horrified that she would insist on going there. I said, well, she's obliged to by our canon law. So that was one area of of uh, difficulty. The other, the other area, quite frankly, is uh, Americans tend to assume that our, our views are ne normative. And there is a certain kind of arrogance. And I will say, watching the bishops at Lambeth walk into uh, Canterbury Cathedral, and because I was a primate, I was in sort of, I think, a special uh, section. I mean, the swagger of the American bishops. I thought, oh dear, can't you just be a little, can't you walk a little more humbly? But anyhow, uh, there's sort of a, uh, a sense that America has, has imposed its culture in so many places. So there's a real, a real resistance, an anger, and it, and it plays out in, our, in the view of the church as well. And so, for instance, um, uh, if you're, if you're in a small province, the Anglican Communion, with, let's say, a, a largely Muslim population around you, you are not afforded the kind of theological latitude that we can enjoy here. You have to read your scripture with the same absolutism with which they read their Quran. And so, uh, you know, saying, well, this text in, doesn't really mean this, or it's influenced by sociological influences present in the, you know, first century or something. You can't do that sort of thing there. So, uh, I mean, the whole question of sexuality really brought this to the, to the fore. And also, too, I will say, uh, I, I gave a retreat to the bishops of Nigeria once, and uh, it was at a, a, a conference center outside of Lagos, and the conference center was run by a priest who asked if he could attend my, my talks to the bishop, my meditations. And I said yes, and at the end of it he asked me, could he have a private meeting with me? And I said sure, and I went to his office, and he said, do you mind if I record this? And I thought, this is very uncomfortable, but I said, all right. So then he picked up a Bible, and he waved it at me, and he said, this is all we have. You have talked about Francis, Benedict, Teresa. You've talked about all these people. I need to know who they are, and we do not know. 
And I realized that part of it is the churches in certain parts of Africa have grown so quickly that theological education has been very sparse. And so uh, some of the things we can deal with, with com that are complex, but we can see you know, various ways of coming at it, uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, if all you've got is the book and a plain reading. And I got very irritated with bishops who would say, well, they're just fundamentalists. I said, that is such a pejorative indictment. They read scripture plainly. Mm -hmm. And I said, and there are times when that's great. For instance, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me, can give a bishop in northern Nigeria the courage to go into a, 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 a camp that is full of uh, kidnapped children and rescue them. I said, you know, plain reading can give you power and courage, so you can't just knock it. So trying to help, help people here understand some of what people were dealing with in other parts of the world. I mean, uh, I remember someone saying to me, well, we should just go and, and uh, get all the, the gay people in, I can't remember what, oh, I think it was Uganda, and just get them to stand up. I said, they'll be killed. It, I said, it's that simple. I mean, the last thing that would help them is for you to march over there and, you know, have a gay pride parade down, you know, the streets of wherever. Yeah, so uh, uh, being sensitive. Uh, and I remember once, I, I mean, I did get the, because the people, the Africans were saying, we need to talk more about this sexuality before you do anything more. This is after, I think, Jean had been uh, uh, approved. And I said to the general convention, to have this conversation, we have to agree not to put anyone forward for ordination of the Episcopate during this triennium so that this conversation that they claim they want to have takes place. Well, it didn't really take place. However, I will say, because I had to go to a primate's meeting, uh, one primate from Africa said to me, you heard us. You heard us, and it changed the whole, the whole tone of the meeting. That there was some sense that an American would defer something for the sake of mm -hmm. these people who felt beleaguered by the public dimension of all this. The other thing is, uh, Jean's, or, uh, Jean's ordination of, and consecration in New Hampshire was beamed across the world. So you're a bishop in Nigeria, and guess what? Your television set has what's going on in your church in the United States. In the old days, it would have been a letter sent, you know, it would arrive mm -hmm. weeks, months later, and some would say, who the hell is this person? In New and where's New Hampshire? But it suddenly made what we were doing part of their lives, too, in a way that created problems, particularly because of the uh, Pentecostal upsurge. And people say, well, we know about your church. So it's very complicated. And I think appreciating that and trying to help people here understand the complexity of it. And what does it mean to be, in some way, a communion mm -hmm. and not just an association of freestanding churches? What does it mean to actually uh, think of your life in relation to its consequences elsewhere? Mm. Um, it was wonderful today to see uh, the president-elect go to St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington. Or did he from Mass? Knowing, knowing the history of the presidency with the Catholic Church. Yeah. And you've spent a lot of time in dialogue with yeah. the Roman Catholic. Yeah. Um, where, where are we with all of that today? And what, what do you think is, especially with Pope Francis, yeah. um, wh where do you think the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church is right now? Well, Frankly, I mean, it's a, it's a very close relationship. And uh, it's complicated by, what would I say, the more public levels. I mean, for instance, P uh, Pope Francis went to All Saints Anglican Church in Rome to bless an icon and to preside at a renewal of baptismal vows taken out of the American 79 prayer book. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I would have to say, I was co-chair of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission for a number of years. Uh, there is such 
ease and rapport. Uh, but when it comes to are Anglican orders valid, it's made more complicated now by the ordination of women. If the Roman Catholic Church ordained women, it would be much easier. But that became an impediment to simply recognizing the orders. But I can tell you, I mean, uh, under, <laughs> not undercover, but, but off, the, off the stage, the, the most sort of public stage, there's incredible back and forth and uh, uh, appreciation of ministries. And uh, uh, I mean, I've, uh, you know, I've had, uh, when, I was, when I was consecrated bishop, uh, there, there was a Jesuit there who, of course, received communion. Uh, I've been asked to concelebrate at uh, uh, a Jesuit funeral. I was told, I mean, I was told, if the archbishop comes, he'll sit in that chair. If he doesn't come, you sit in that chair. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, this is a little bit crazy, <laughs> but anyhow. Come a long way. So we've come a long way, and I, I think um, uh, Carl Rahner once said, uh, there comes a time in the life of the church when it has to adjust itself to what actually goes on in the hearts and minds of the lay people. Mm. And I think laity have managed the, uh, the ecumenical divide very nicely. But there's a certain, what would I say, we all have our institutional uh, pride. And uh, the whole idea of, you know, well, you know, my my separateness from you actually confirms my specialness. And, and getting over some of that mm -hmm. is really complicated, but that's sort of part of what I think Christy Nooney is all about. Uh, there's something called now uh, receptive, I think it's called receptive uh, ecumenism. And instead of saying, well, this is where I stand, where do you stand? It's what is in your tradition that could actually enrich mine? It's finding gifts in the other tradition mm -hmm. as opposed to, mm -hmm. well, how do you believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist? Well, that's not the way we say it. It's rather, uh, tell me about your Eucharistic practice and, and I'll tell you about mine. What does it mean to ce celebrate the Eucharist? What does it mean to share the body of Christ? That kind of approach. So much more of that's going on. The other thing I noticed is, and I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit, a lot of I would call it uh, basic church unity, has nothing to do with denominations per se. It has to do with recognizing, uh, uh, what would I say, brothers and sisters in a different tradition who speak the same spiritual language. So, I mean, there are many, uh, you know, I'll say many Roman Catholics with whom I feel much more comfortable than I do with certain kinds of Episcopalians. Uh, or Methodists or whatever. So uh, I think the spirit is sort of mixing things up mm -hmm. and we discover allies and friends in the spirit in other traditions who are intimates mm -hmm. uh, and much more so than often members of our immediate community. So you're still traveling a lot. You, you've been doing work with the church in Cuba yeah, yeah. and the Holy Land and yeah. so on. So, so what, what do you see going on globally right now in, in the life of the church and, and the church's role in society? Well, um, I, I would say I appreciate the fact that the gospel is always locally embodied. And I appreciate more and more how different local manifestations of the life of the church are. And how, uh, well, for instance, the Episcopal Church has a number of, uh, I mean, it includes a number of uh, pro uh, dioceses in, in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And at one time, Cuba was part of the Episcopal Church, too. Uh, and there is a sense, I mean, I found this when I was uh, presiding bishop. Uh, New York would expect records to be kept a certain way. And I would say, and, and I mean, I understood, you know, you need proof of whatever, that the funds were spent this way or that way. And I realized that the cultures mm -hmm. didn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our accountabilities, and this is true, this is true in not just Latin America, but in other places as well. The Episcopal Church entering into some kind of uh, 
companionship or partnership with a, a church somewhere else uh, suddenly arrives with its, its way of doing things, which may not be their way. Mm -hmm. And I've had, I've had bishops in other parts of the Anglican community say to me, you don't trust us. Mm -hmm. You're treating us like children. Uh, and I say, I'm sorry, but for IRS purposes, people who gave the money because you were going to you know, build a school, and you say, well, actually, right now, it's much more important to build a clinic. I'd say, I, I understand, but we can't just move things around. The, the donors have to know mm -hmm. <laughs> and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, appreciating the local reality, I think, has been a, a very, how is, how is Jesus showing up in this church? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you really have to take off all kinds of blinders because you say, oh, this is chaos. This is chaos. I mean, I remember, I mean, this is sort of funny. I mean, I've done endless sort of holy weeks in cathedrals and, you know, uh, Anglo-Catholic parishes, everything is perfectly done. Well, I was doing Palm Sunday in Cuba, and it was a, a church in the country surrounded by a field, and there was a horse in the field, and the priest, because I was presiding, said, well, what, do you, what would you like to do? And I said, well, you know, we have this nice field. I think we should have a palm procession out into the field and around the church. Well, he looked stricken, but that's what I said. So <laughs> we went out and around the church. And then I realized, ah, this field is occupied by a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we came around the church where the horse was, and uh, someone was washing the horse. And we managed the circuitous route to avoid the signs of the horse that were on the ground. We got back into the church clean shod. And I got into the pulpit and I looked out the window and the horse had palms sticking out of its mouth. It was eating palms that had fallen along the way. And I thought, the next time, I think that Thursday I was at St. Mary the Virgin in New York for the Triduum. And I began, I said, I just have to tell you. <laughs> you know, a different world. A different, <laughs> different world. world. So it's interesting that both Cuba and Jerusalem are in the news again yeah, because yeah. Of, of our political. Yes. Uh, and and I, I'm aware of the church, the vibrant church in Cuba, yeah. and aware of the struggle of the Palestinian Christian community. Yeah. What, what recommendations would you make to the State Department about our, our, well, our relationships with those two communities? Well, I think, I, I assume that uh, Biden will be lifting some of what's been imposed on Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as, as um, the Palestinian situation, I sort of, at this point, don't see how, with these land masses that are separated from one another, how you can create authentically mm -hmm. a two-state solution. Yep. And I think, fr quite frankly, I mean, uh, there, are, there are a number of uh, Arab Israelis. Uh, I mean, there is, a, there is a kind of discrimination that goes on, quite obviously, particularly in, in sort of schools and whatnot. Uh, but I would think probably uh, the reality is uh, that they become um, fully valued, e co-equal uh, mm -hmm. citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I think that's, that's probably more realistic than hanging on to the two-state the, two state the two state solution. solution with endless right. uh, new settlements being built and roads that bypass this, that, and the other thing. And I will say, I mean, it, it's amazing to me the what would I call it, the endurance mm -hmm. of the Palestinian. It's amazing to me how one day your child can, can go through a checkpoint to school, uh, the next day the child can't come back through the checkpoint, it has to stay there, so a parent has to provide for if the child can't come back at the end of the day, there is somewhere mm -hmm. in, let's say, Bethlehem, uh, he can go stay with some family. I mean the endless, totally idiosyncratic sh opening and shutting of places. I mean, I, it just is so wearying. Mm -hmm. yep. 
uh, and there have been some Palestinian filmmakers who've made brilliant films of the idiocy of what's going on in terms of uh, a, a kind of, a, what would I call it, a, a subtle pressure mm -hmm. you know, to sort of make, make life as complicated and difficult in a kind of daily rhythm as it possibly can. In this diocese, there is a kind of a renewed relationship with the church in Jerusalem yeah. and with St. George's College yeah. and so on. And I'm sure there'll be opportunities yeah. for members of St. Paul's and others in yeah. the diocese to get engaged. And there's a new bishop who, uh, I mean, I've, I've known all the bishops, and this one uh, is a, a graduate of Virginia Seminary. And uh, very at ease, in both cultures, which I think uh, will be helpful mm -hmm. uh, looking ahead. So. so we have just gone on a wonderful spiral beginning in uh, Bryn Mawr and yes. Chicago and around the world, and now we're back here where we started. Yeah. And uh, you are, you know, it's interesting with COVID, we've all ad adapted to uh, Zooming and, yeah. and so on. So. Um, those of us who are thinking of re re retirement, uh, the R word, uh, what's, what, what are you learning and, and enjoying about this, this <laughs> returning to where you started in your life? Well, I think first of all, uh, we have a number of friends here who, who have children our, our kids' ages. They're, not, they're all grown up in their 40s or 50s. Uh, we see someone's daughter and we think it's our friend, you know. Whatever, but uh, uh, that's a that's a, a very consoling to sort of be with people who we've known since we were young parents, and we have a, a similar cultural history. You know, we remember certain events and whatnot. So that's consoling. Um, when I was in Cuba teaching uh, uh, on one of my uh, forays. A professor at the seminary in Matanzas, where I was teaching, asked me, "You know, uh, what are you what are you doing when you're not here teaching?" I said, "Well, I'm retired." He said, "No, no, a pensionado." I said, oh, "Oh, okay." So my answer now is, "No, I'm not retired. I'm pensioned," and I say it very <laughs> resolutely so that people are sort of embarrassed of having asked the question. Uh, but I will say, the, the COVID has kept me much more close to home, which has been good. Uh, I mean, I, I find as I get older, it's the travel piece that is really wearying. It's not so much the event that you're going to, mm -hmm. but uh, the security in the airport, the unpleasantness of flying. Uh, I mean, it is really sort of brutal these days. Uh, it's very wearing. And, and I mean, Phoebe has said, whenever you say yes to something, take into account the travel time to and from and what that costs in terms of you know, stress and all the rest of it. So uh, uh, I would, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't retire from ministry, really. You might retire from certain modes of ministry. I mean, like you, I mean, you came here in all innocence, didn't you, to retire? <laughs> and look what's happened. So, you know, I, <laughs> and St. Paul's will get, a, get its rector and probably someone is gonna say, oh, now you're free to do something else. So. Free at last, free, free at last. At last. <laughs> but, well, thank you so much for, well, I've enjoyed for coming and uh, being with us. And I'm sure uh, lots of uh, questions and comments from our community will come forward. So thank okay, you so well, much. I'll, I'll be ready on Frank. Zoom to meet the congregation in a more informal way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Curious, you know, that's like uh, maybe uh, not the level of humility, perhaps, that you were hoping they would convey. And and I'm just wondering, you know, how how you would then tell somebody, especially an adult, from to hold them, to hold themselves uh, with less swagger, and would they really know, and could they really? as adults manage to do that? 
Well, I I think the swagger was more the sense that um, the life of the Anglican communion ought to be normative from the perspective of uh, Episcopal bishops in this country. I think that was sort of uh, what was uh, bodily uh, manifested, as it were. Sure. And I do think I do think out of that Lambeth conference, which was extremely difficult, mm -hmm. uh, and it was very difficult for uh, us from the United States. I think um, many bishops had a much clearer sense of the impact of what we do here mm -hmm. and how it affects other parts of the world. And there was, I think, a had, had the had the marching into the cathedral occurred at the end of the Lambeth conference, I think it would have probably been much more, what would I say, uh, restrained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, it's, uh, it's on the, it's on the, their website. It's a, a Zoom thing. I'm just telling someone who's trying to figure out how to get on this conversation. Yeah, I, po I posted it in the chat window as we were closing, but it's okay. on the St. Paul's website and it's on the liturgy link. I mean, we've posted it like in four places. Yeah, it's on the St. Paul's website. Paul's yeah, Paul's if they go to worship yeah. um, for Sunday, they'll find it. Go to worship, yes. Mm -hmm. So we're yes. just uh, opening the floor for questions and comments on Bishop Frank's um, time with us this morning. Anybody have? I do see other faces. Yeah, we just want to make sure that people, if they're speaking, unmute themselves. So, because we don't know if somebody's asking. So, that, that's all. <coughs> do you have a question, Amber? Or you covered your questions? No, I think I asked enough questions. I'm keeping my mouth shut. Yeah, um, you're a very good interviewer, I will say. Thank you, sir. <laughs> no, and, and you know, one of the one of the conversations that came up at coffee hour was, uh, "Are you thinking of writing a biography?" Um, I wrote something called "Tracking Down the Holy Ghost," which is probably about as close as I'll get to uh, an autobiography. It's 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 to some degree a memoir, but it's also what I've learned along the way, rather than simply a description of my life. So uh, that's that's out and about if anyone uh, cares to look that up and it, you can get it on Amazon and you can get it from the church publishing uh, company. Cool. I'm, one, I'm wondering with regard to your upbring, upbringing, if you had any particular influences that you would in retrospect tie to your later interest in work internationally through travel or any other experience because I, I can see where maybe beginning that sort of thing at an older age might um, seem a little overwhelming. Yeah. Um, as, as a child, um, my family spent several summers abroad. Mm -hmm. Uh, my father, after the Second World War, among other things, was the American representative for Alfa Romeo. And so that took us uh, to Italy uh, s several summers. And I was, I guess, about 12. Mm -hmm. And here was a different language. I mean, we also went to France and other countries. Uh, and I was fascinated by uh, this. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 different languages, different languages. Different languages. Different languages. Different languages. enjoyed taking my younger brother down the street in a small Italian village to a pastry shop every afternoon and in Italian ordering uh, whatever it is we wanted to have. Uh, so I think that probably played into uh, a later interest in um, uh, sort of international reality. But I will say, I mean, it was, at one point, I was presiding at a meeting of bishops and we had agreed that we were going to go the, at the next meeting of bishops to Honduras. 
and there was great nervousness. And it, I mean, Honduras was not dangerous at that point, but anyhow, there was great nervousness. And I said, I asked, I said, how many of you have been outside the continental United States? And I was surprised at how few had been. And uh, I think part of what the Anglican communion has done through a relationship of dioceses in different countries to one another, a number of bishops who'd never been out of the continental United States have gone to other parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that I think is part of the, there's a kind of insularity, quite frankly, to the United States. Uh, I mean, one thing I learned to do whenever I went abroad, and it was a different language, uh, Korea or Italy or wherever I was, and I had to give a talk, I always gave part of it in the language of that country, even if it meant uh, you know, four paragraphs and someone recorded it so that I could, you know, repeat it with some degree of fluency or a seeming fluency. And I can't tell you, I mean, I'd have to then say at some point, but now I have to continue in English. But the very fact I'd made the effort uh, was so important because so many Americans just march into places and, uh, you know, don't even ask, well, do you speak English? They just assume <laughs> that wherever they are, that someone will speak English, uh, which again is disrespectful in a way. And learning the cultures. I mean, for instance, um, in, in certain countries, if you're presented publicly with a present, you do not open it. And uh, I was in, I think it was Uganda and in front of several thousand people and presented with a wrapped present, which I promptly opened and people gasped. And part of it is that you don't open it publicly because, you know, if you looked displeased, it would be so embarrassing to the people who gave it to you. So you would simply say thank you and uh, it would be opened later on. And being aware of those little things. So I used to do, uh, particularly when I went to Asia, uh, uh, I would have uh, people come in and do a cultural preparation so that if it was bowing, I knew what level to bow at, or if I needed to venerate the tomb of a saint in Russia, I knew how to do that. I remember going uh, with a deputation to a Russian monastery, and I didn't know it at the time, but the monk who met us said to the, the, the translator, why are these infidels here? And in the course of the meeting or the visit to the monastery, uh, I was taken to the uh, tomb that had been uh, lost for a number of years after the Russian Revolution, but refounded. Re uh, and I, I asked if I could venerate the, the principal saint of the monastery. And I had learned how to do this, which meant kneeling down and kissing uh, the coffin at several places, making the sign of the cross and whatnot. And then I learned from the translator, when we left, that same monk turned to her and said, they are our brothers in Christ. And the very simple gesture of venerating the tomb in a way recognized by the monk as of his culture, his religious tradition, uh, changed his whole view of who we were. So, you know, uh, all those things I found, I love the diplomacy. I love the diplomacy. Uh, that was this, uh, I was sad to give that up because as Desmond Tutu said, it's all in Anglicanism, it's all about relationship. Uh, it comes down to people trusting one another. Yes, there may be a common theological ground or common liturgy, but it really, uh, at the end of the day is uh, the incarnation and feeling that we truly are uh, human, human beings available to one another in the depths of our own uh, identity. Bishop Griswold, um, yes. in, in the interview, you talked about a plain reading of scripture operating as a source of courage. Um, yes. and you gave the example in Africa. Wh what, were, what were some other um, practices or things that gave you courage um, when you had you know, when you stood up and for Gene Robinson and what, what are things in your life that have been sources of courage for you? 
Well, I would say, quite frankly, the, the, the fundamental one is prayer. Uh, and, and by that, I don't necessarily mean, you know, a lot of vocal prayer or a lot of intercession, but simply silently being available to the spirit who works within us with sighs too deep for words, below the level of our own consciousness, the, the spirit of the sun crying Abba in the depths of who we are. And just trying to open myself to that, that energy, that force, that power within me, and then show up as best you can at whatever is going on. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free and just see what happens. Uh, I mean, I will tell you, I mean, things like, well, for instance, uh, I once had to deal with a congregation. I'd made a decision for them. This was in the Diocese of Chicago and the congregation was enraged, absolutely enraged. I knew it was what needed to be done, but they didn't. Uh, and uh, I was called to a meeting of the congregation and I arrived and felt quite nervous. Uh, and I said, I think you are very angry because your former rector left you. And they screamed, no, we're not angry. And it was perfectly clear that rage was uh, uppermost in their minds. And then a, a woman got up and she said, I have, I have uh, inspected your handwriting and it is perfectly clear you have a fine mind, but you have no heart whatsoever. And several <laughs> hundred people said, amen. And the curious thing is, I felt absolutely peaceful. Uh, and I, I mean, I was able, I don't know how, not to be defensive. Uh, I simply said, I, I'm sorry that this decision has so troubled you, but I do believe it's the right one. And I will say, later on, they could see that too, some a couple of years later. But anyhow, I thought, well, where did this sudden sense of peace come from? And I thought, well, this is the way the spirit works. You pray, you might pray for you know something or other, and it doesn't come. And then God surprises you by taking the energy of that prayer and using it, surprising you, so that you know it isn't your cleverness or your ability. I mean, sometimes I've said things and I thought that is really wise and insightful. Where did that come from? And I think it's the spirit working within us. So um, uh, a, a practice of being availability to the spirit, uh, praying within us and then allowing the spirit to sort of show up in your words and actions uh, on the spirit's terms uh, and not sort of feeling that you have to manufacture everything out of your own psychological energy or imagination, knowing that, that God can overrule or use even stupid things you do. Remember when I was first ordained going to visit someone in the Bryn Mawr Hospital, and it was the head of the older guild and she said, darling, there's a picture of martinis on, the, on the, you know, the bureau over there. Why don't you have a drink and sit down on the bed? And I'd come with my little prayer book. This is my first sick visit. I thought, oh, this is, I guess this is what one does. And I sat on the bed and in came a nurse looking absolutely horrified. And uh, uh, I, real I realized that this was sort of uh, the spirit saying, you were so uptight trying to be appropriate and religious. I'm really gonna throw you a curveball. And uh, after that, I could sort of wander into a hospital and thought whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I was much more relaxed and could pray more easily and not be, you know, ecclesiastical in some way. So uh, sometimes we're knocked off our sensibilities uh, in order to uh, be embarrassed in some way in order to be free to be whatever the spirit wants us to be. I just have a quick question. You were extraordinarily um, busy and a lot, there were a lot of arrows being shot at you during your term as PB. What did you do that was non-church so that you could just take a deep breath, not prayer, but I mean, take a deep yeah. breath and relax and get away from it all? Well, uh, two things. I think early on in being the presiding bishop, 
I went to a, uh, uh, a psychologist to talk about leadership and my, and my family of origin and how that might play out in, in positive and negative ways and how I dealt with things. Anyhow, I said, I'm under a lot of strain. And he, he said, okay, your choice is Prozac or the gym. <laughs> and I said, I think maybe the gym is healthier than the Prozac. He said, I think so. So in fear and trembling, I went off to the Harvard Club in New York and went to this upper room filled with strange machinery. And this very nice guy came over and said, can I help you? And I was terrified because I thought he's, he's, he runs this place. And I said, well, love, uh, uh, he said, oh, well, you've never been here before, have you? And I said, no. And he said, well, you, you just come and we'll work out. A, I'll make a, up a workout for you. I'll teach you. And, and so I rented a locker because I knew if I put some money down, I'd actually do it. And this became, uh, I mean, I'd start every day walking through Grand Central Station over to the Harvard Club and an hour in the gym and got to know a whole group of people who are very different from, you know, what I saw most of the time in terms of the church, uh, all kinds of folks. So uh, it was recreational, but it also was a, a kind of alternative reality. And I could feel by nine o'clock in the morning when I got to my office, I could feel, okay, I've, you know, lifted weights for 40 minutes or run or done something or other. I've done something that uh, means that I'm on top of the day and I can put up with whatever's going on. So that was one thing. The other thing, we have a house in New Hampshire and I love to scythe, use an old fashioned scythe and just going through a field scything and thinking of, <laughs> what would I say? Uh, uh, difficult people <laughs> and saying this is this is better than a temper tantrum you know just five the grass charlotte you're going to ask a question can you hear us uh can can you hear me or i'm having we can hear you now. yep go ahead i can hear you Oh, okay. I'm having trouble with the sound on the computer for some reason. Um, um, actually, no, I don't have one on the top of my head. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Except I'm at a loss for a question. <laughs> I, I actually have one. Um, yeah. this should, I'm Ruth Desiderio. Thank you for joining us this morning. I loved hearing what you had to say, and this is a privilege to get to talk with you. So thank you for being at St. Paul's. Thank you. Um, as you can imagine, in the middle of a search, um, I, I was struck by your story, of, and I'm sure it's not unique to you, um, but that you were in a situation where you said, you know, you were talking with the congregation and you were saying, I knew that it was needed. To yeah. be, th that it needed to be done, but they didn't. So, right. and, and there are a lot of different reasons why a, a congregation might feel that way. You yeah. mentioned the anger perhaps or residual loss or whatever. So yeah. how did that play out? And, you know, I, I think that it's inevitable that a congregation will confront something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the, I'll just back up and say I, many bishops who come from a parish setting are accustomed to, what would I say? Uh, yes, there can be conflicts within the life of the congregation, but basically they think of it as a, as a positive experience. And so many clergy would say to me, I love my parish, I'm loved by the parish, which is great. I was always happy to hear that there was a good relationship. However, when you become a bishop, you basically, I mean, this is probably overdrawn, but it's, it's true to a, a, a fair extent, you're sort of the emergency room. And what you're gonna get are problems. You're not gonna get everything is going wonderful at St. whatever it is, you're gonna get that there's a problem. And uh, for, for many bishops, uh, that's very painful because there's, they're accustomed to forming, what would I say, uh, positive relationships with congregations and not having to be the person uh, delivering a, a difficult decision. And I felt very much, I mean, I didn't have to do a great deal of this, but uh, in this case, 
uh, it was a congregation. I mean, I, I'll give you a little bit of the background just so you have a sense of it. It was a congregation that had a much loved rector who uh, accepted a call to another congregation. And the church that uh, he was rector of, it, I'd never heard of this before, had sent a committee of the congregation to the church that was calling him to be the rector so that they could discern from their point of view, the rightness of his taking this new position. Cool. And they felt no. Uh, and they were, I mean, he was a wonderful priest and they loved him and he had an assistant. And the congregation felt, well, if he goes, we've got the assistant who can do everything just the way X did it. And the assistant was a wonderful person, but I knew, I knew the congregation, I knew him, and I knew that this was not going to be good, uh, that it might work very briefly, but uh, his gifts and his style would not, not be uh, congruent long term. And so that's, that was the issue. And uh, I mean, uh, and he, I, I found, I found the the assistant, uh, a, a congregation within the diocese that I think was exactly right, and it grew tremendously because of his own temperament and his own views, and the other congregation called a new rector ultimately, and uh, though several people who were most upset with me, uh, said, you know, as difficult as it was it was the right decision. And so you, you do, bishops do have to take a larger view at times and you can't always explain. And unlike a parish, if someone's upset, you can't always go and have coffee with someone and really talk it through and restore the relationship. Uh, sometimes you just have to make decisions and, and pray that they were right and ultimately they'll be understood, but you can't guarantee that of course. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else as the snows continue to fall? <laughs> really I feel like I should have to help. Okay. Go ahead, Clark. No, no. I just was I... saying it's pretty in just yeah. the hill. It is. Yeah. We'll hear too. And Bishop, I, I, am, I felt obligated to ask a question because the last time I had the opportunity to have a conversation with you was during our sesquicentennial. And um, I was on the vestry at that time because I'm a glutton for punishment and um, I had the opportunity to have lunch with you and your wife. And I came down with a complete laryngitis uh, the day before all of the celebrations, all I through all of the celebratory. It was kind of karma. I think a lot of people were like, great, finally she's, you know, she's silenced. But um, I was so devastated because I had an opportunity to have, you know, I, had, I did have lunch. We were in a group, had lunch with you and, and then and, uh, Barbara Harris. And I mean, what a great opportunity to have conversations. And I was silent. So now I, I remember making, the I silent, to make that right. silent woman. Yes. The silent woman. <laughs> the silent that was me. <laughs> and it hasn't happened, happened since. Everyone can attest to that. So oh, yeah. <laughs> thank right, you. Clark. Clark, I'm, I'm glad you were full voice today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Gosh, the sesquicentennial, that was a long time ago, wasn't it, Bishop? 19, yeah. 2006, four days after you stepped down as... That's right, indeed. exactly, exactly, right after. And you so, asked me when we were talking about it if we wanted a uh, wanted to have you come preach because you were presiding bishop, and I said, no, we wanted to come have you come <laughs> preach because you were our friend from the time you were at St. Martin's. That's so right. It's good that you were there. It's wonderful. It's wonderful knowing after handing over the primatial staff in the Washington Cathedral that I had something to do the following Sunday. <laughs> I was delighted to be in St. Paul's. <laughs> Anything else? Well, we'd love to have you back sometime to come and preach, but thank you so much for, well, um, thank you. I, it was really great to, uh, you know, sit with you and, and just share your journey and and it's great that we're we're local and the good work of St. Paul's will continue. And we know that you'll continue to hold us in your prayers. And I've let the search committee know that you you have you're gonna send them, we've got a copy of it, 
a recording of a lovely prayer for them in their discernment. So we're going to make that available to the search committee. So again, we're very grateful to you. Would you like to um, maybe close with a prayer for for our our parish and our and our country? Oh uh, yes, but let me also say thank you to St. Paul's for being so helpful with uh, uh, St. Luke's in Germantown. I mean, they've had an amazing uh, uh, run on. Uh, need there, and you've just been so marvelous in, in helping meet some of that. So thank you so much. And Phoebe's on their vestry, isn't she? Yes, she is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let us pray, dear friends. Um, let us pray for our country. Let us pray for our president, our vice president, members of Congress, all those who are filling various offices. Um, let us pray that um, the welfare of the country with respect to the life we all share will be the primary focus of all that is done that uh, the various emotions and pressures from various groups on different sides of things um, may not draw people away from uh, seeking the common good, uh, seeking what is best for uh, all of us, especially those who are uh, most on the edges and most suffering from particularly this season of pandemic. Let us pray that we may be um, uh, related to the larger world beyond our borders in a way that again serves the common good on a global scale. Let us pray for uh, the Episcopal Church, for Michael Curry. Let us pray for Daniel, our bishop. Let us pray for the immediacy of our congregation, in this case, St. Paul's in Chestnut Hill. Let us pray that the fullness of life in the spirit uh, may root and ground people and clergy as together uh, they seek to embody what God deeply desires, again, for the well-being, not only of the congregation, but of the larger community, uh, those who stand most in need. And give us always, O oh God, the, the capacity to reflect your desire, reflect your deep love for everything you've made, uh, reflect your capacity for compassion and mercy and truth, and guide us as the days unfold uh, in ways that uh, may surprise us, may challenge us, us, may challenge us, but may always reveal your honor and your glory and your deep desire for the well-being of all. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our brother, our savior, and our friend. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. So blessings on all of you and. Uh, um, as everything has to end with say, stay safe. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Bishop. Thank you so much.